Okay, good evening. We're going to get started. I am Bill Brown, the Director of New Faith Expressions for the Baltimore Washington Conference. I'm happy to welcome my co host back again, Reverend Dr. Rodney Smothers. Good evening, Rodney. Good evening, sir. How are you? I am well. It is a joy to gather with you on a for a training Tuesday that's actually happening on a Tuesday this week. Um, okay. Somebody uh, must be having trouble signing in because they are uh, trying to get my phone. So I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead. You go ahead. You you de you you get to deal with our technical difficulties this evening. So as people are signing on, this is Training Tuesday, reopening, renewing, and restarting. What now? What next? A couple of things to keep in mind as you are logging on. You can see us. We cannot see you, but I know that you're here because I have a little participants list that is popping up each time you log in. So if you would like to interact with our panel, who we'll introduce in a moment, you can use the Q&A feature. I've noticed a couple of you have tried to raise your hands, and that's wonderful. Um, we don't, uh, we kind of ignore that. So if you have a question, use the Q&A feature. Um, it's at the button in your toolbar. I see questions coming in already. Uh, the chat feature also um, is, um, is disabled and I see somebody had a little trouble logging in, but they uh, obviously, since you're asking a question, you have successfully logged in. So welcome. Let's introduce our panel and then we'll open with a word of prayer. And uh, I'm going to let the panelists self introduce and I'm going to just call on them as they are uh, positioned on my screen. So this is no particular order than how they show up on my computer screen. And let's start with. Chris Bishop, just who you are and where you are from or where you're serving or what you do. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Chris Bishop. I serve as the lead pastor at Faith Point United Methodist Church and also am one of the pastors at the Common Table, uh, kind of an online campus birthed out of Faith Point. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. What I do is um, I you know, whatever is coming down the track, I guess, at the at the moment between work and, and my girls and all the other things. So, yeah, I, if you want to tell me what I'm doing, that would be much, much help. So, thanks. Before we go to our next introduction, let me say to people who are trying to sign in, we have over 700 people who have registered for this broadcast. And all of you are trying to log on at the same time. So uh, if you don't get it the first time, come back and try again. Several of you are saying you ha are having audio problems. But again, check your system first to make certain that you're not um, in any way preventing the sound from coming through. Thank you. We appreciate your patience. Thank you, Rodney. You're so eloquent with that. So thank you, sir. Um, moving down from where Chris is, Ben Trawick. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Trawick. I am the uh, campus pastor for the Common Table Online. This is the online campus that came from Faith Point United Methodist Church. Uh, we've been worshiping online for about four years now, and I'm also the worship leader at Faith Point, the music leader. So uh, I'm excited to be here and part of the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. And Donna. I'm Donna Claycomb Sokol. I serve as the pastor at Mount Vernon Place in downtown DC. And I'm also really grateful to be with you tonight. I know that many of us are spending our days on screens, so we also really appreciate your sacrifice of time tonight. And I'm grateful for the invitation. Thank you, Donna. And last but not least, William. Greetings. My name is William Cheney. Um, I'm a member of the Baltimore Washington Conference, but I'm currently um, on extension ministry as a coach, um, I'm living in Aldi, Virginia, but I equip churches and pastors to reach new people, to be vibrant, and to reach their full potential in reaching new people. Wonderful, thank you. As we get started, Rodney, would you please open us up in a word of prayer? Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the ability to gather friends and colleagues 
and discuss this vital expanding ministry of the church. We are living in a new season. A new opportunity awaits us. So as we gather tonight, share with those who've been doing this for a while, hear about the different opportunities that await us. May we gather with expectations. May we gather with hearts willing to learn, to grow, and to serve you. These and all things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now it's my turn, Rodney, to answer some technical questions that are coming through my email. So as um, we try to do that, as we get started tonight, um, I was looking back at our schedule. We had our first, I guess, our first pandemic training Tuesday on March 23rd, and don't get confused, March 23rd was a Monday. That was our first training Tuesday, but on a Monday, as we began to look at how to do online worship. And now that we have been in quarantine for about eight weeks now and doing online worship for just as long, um, we kind of thought maybe the questions we've been hearing kind of, I, I group them all together into, you know, what now? You know, we keep doing this. When are we going to reopen? How long are we going to have to do this online worship um, as we move forward? And so we're going to have a little conversation about that, but also a conversation about what next. And I know we talked last week, last Thursday, about physically reopening our buildings. And I know people are excited and beginning to undertake that kind of planning. But what about restarting and relaunching our ministries and looking at that of what we could leave behind and what we want to keep, what we want to get rid of and what we may want to start. And so this panel was put together tonight with that in mind. And we're gonna jump into some of the questions we've been um, kind of curating over the last couple of weeks that people have been asking. And I think I'm gonna target this one to you, Donna, because I know both Ben and Chris have been doing online worship for four years. And so eight weeks is a drop in the bucket to the two of them. But what have you learned since moving to online worship and ministry eight weeks ago? Yeah, so our first online worship was on March the 15th, and we found out that we would be going online on Thursday, March the 12th. And then we quickly learned that if you have a smartphone, you really do have a tool that God can use. And God does use our tools, whatever we're willing to offer and to believe. Uh, I would also say that almost everything that we're doing right now takes twice as much time. And so things have to be critically thought out in advance, that, but everything is taking a whole lot more time than you might ever imagine. Even though we're depending upon technology to work, it doesn't always mean technology is going to work. Uh, there are some things that are completely out of our control. And we experienced that on the second Sunday when I think Facebook Live experienced more traffic than it might have ever had on a Sunday morning at 10 or 11 o'clock where things slowed down significantly. So even though you poured your heart and soul into things, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be uh, carried off by the tool that you are depending upon to bring it to people. I think experimentation is key and constantly asking the question, what did we learn today? What do we need to pivot or how do we need to pivot? What do we need to not do? What do we need to add? And those questions have now become weekly questions instead of seasonal questions. They're questions that we're asking ourselves every single Sunday as we try to learn what is working and what's not working and to move ahead. The other thing that I would say is that the spirit is always busy and the spirit does work in and through technology in ways that I might not have ever imagined prior to March 15th. And I'm profoundly grateful for that. Wonderful. Very good answer. Um, some questions that are coming in that I'm going to just, I don't want to dismiss, but kind of answer quickly. If you have, if you have some technical questions about online worship, I do want to remind you that on March 23rd, we did have another uh, training Tuesday, but on a Monday that covered all of the aspects about equipment and streaming services. So we, I do want to tell you, you can go to the conference website, bwcumc.org, and go under the training Tuesday um, uh, drop down, and you will find past videos. Um, 
from Training Tuesdays that will cover some of those questions. Now, um, I guess I'll kind of group these together uh, for, for probably for Ben and Chris and, you know, William and Donna, if you um, have an answer to this, of course, we want to hear from you, but you, the two of you have been doing this the longest. And I know uh, most of, uh, most of the uh, clergy and lady in churches have just been, as Donna said, working twice as hard just to get um, the content ready and up and available for their congregations. Um, but some are beginning to ask, all right, so we're showing this and people can watch it, but how do we engage people who are watching us online? So how would you, how would you answer that? How do you engage people so they're not just passive viewers of, of your online content? Well, there, go ahead, Chris. No, 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 go. no you're, you're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, there's just, the, the answer is there's no, you know, there is no one right way to engage with folks online. And the easiest way to, the easiest way to explain it is to think about your online service as if it were an in-person worship service. Think about the people who are attending your service and watching your service online as if they are attending your in-person worship service. Because that's basically what's happening. The, the tools are different and the process is different, but the relationship is actually the same. So depending on the platform you're using, depending on the method you're using to do your worship service, um, you'll have different ways of knowing who's there and who isn't and what's going on and whether or not you're able to chat with people during the service or things like that. Um, but the, the, the basic premise of if you know someone's there, connecting with that person in some way via email, via chat, via a phone call to them if you have that information, but connecting and making that connection with the people that are with you um, is, is, the, is step one in starting that community. Uh, for us doing church online, we found that doing it in a place where we can chat during the service has been a really helpful way for us to build community because we're able to have that immediate engagement uh, with anyone that wants to have it because they can jump into the chat with us as as we do church. It's kind of a neat thing because when you do church online, you can talk while the pastor's talking, just, you know, right out loud in front of everyone. And normally we can't do that in in our in-person. So it happens a lot at Faith Point, but um, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's really just encouraging conversation in whatever way that conversation can happen, whether it's post service in Facebook comments or in emails or, or whatever that looks like for your community. Okay. Yeah, I, I would kind of echo that, that, you know, I mean, think about, think about what we're doing online right now, more as a a kind of ordinary time Sunday versus like a Christmas or Easter. Um, and, and even for Christmas and Easter, we don't want guests, first time guests especially, to come in and then come back a next time and feel like it was a bait and switch experience. And so the more authentic that you can make your, um, your space, your online space reflective of what you do in person, then there's fewer surprises when we come back to meet in person. Um, and so I know that that's been a big thing for us um, coming in. Like Ben said, there's, there's conversation in our chats all the time. Uh, one of the very first services we did online, half of the conversation was about Ben's cat laying on the back of the sofa. Um, and honestly, that's, that's kind of the caliber of conversation that happens uh, around the coffee at Faith Point. And so, um, you know, it's, it's trying to find ways to engage. Um, if, if musicality of like traditional music is something that is a high value for your congregation, um, then have conversation about that. Um, you know, and, and pick a couple of your, your stellar greeters who can just be in the chat or wherever you're interacting and asking those questions that they do naturally, but just online. I want to direct this next question to uh, anyone who wants to answer it. But one person is saying, is there anyone on the panel without a staff? And I guess what they're really saying is, can you do this without having a staff to support you? So uh, 
I think people sometimes forget that we all started as one, we were the staff, and then we expanded it. So would you share with our audience um, how you do it, how many people it takes, and what your suggestions would be for churches where there are solopreneurs? Yeah, at, so at the common table for the first couple of years that we were doing it, um, I was the only staff member. And my, I was the only one, as far as a staff goes, to put those services together and make them happen. Now, that is not to say that I was the only one creating those services. Um, so if you are in a position where it is your sole responsibility to make church online happen, happen if you're kind of the, that one person show, um, it is really critical to reach out and engage with your church community and find volunteers um, and give those volunteers ownership over your online church experience, right? So for our volunteers, we have one person every week that rotates and it's a, it's a group of about 12 or so volunteers that I've, you know, been able to drum up over the years um, that as the lead worshiper for our service. And this is the person who I send, I actually send them a script that I have written for them to kind of walk everyone through the service. Our online worship services are all pre-recorded. Uh, so we're not doing, we're not doing live worship right now. Um, but so like that, that person is, is one of my volunteers for the week. And then we'll reach out to people over the weeks uh, to ask them to just, hey, we know that you love playing worship music. So can you grab your guitar and you know sit in a stairwell with your phone and record yourself playing a song? And we'll include that in a library that's kind of growing for music to use for church online and things like that. So if you are a, a one person show for making online church happen, you definitely want to tap into the rich you know volunteer group. There's just so many people out there that want to be a part of worship, right? And so when we do it online, just like when we do it in person, you know, we're not just relying on the lead pastor at our church to do every single element of the service, right? We have uh, volunteers and lay leaders stepping into some of those roles to make church happen. So if you're a one person show, it, I, it is, it can be challenging at times, but um, definitely reach out for volunteers. But I would also say your one person show is your starting place. And one of my favorite greeting cards reads, I will not compare myself to strangers on the internet. And I think it's very easy to compare ourselves right now. One of my dear friends in Charlotte posted a huge, I mean, a picture of their large technical team and the six monitors in the back of the sanctuary. And our first Sunday, we had an iPhone resting on top of a music stand. I went to bed and the last text I got on March 14th was, you do have a tripod, right? And I was like, well, no, I don't have a tripod, but we had an iPhone sitting on top of a music stand that was propped up on 10 hymnals. And so don't allow what you think you don't have to prevent you from starting with what you do have. And what you do have is yourself and a call and a claim that God has put up on your life and prayerfully a smartphone. And if you have those things, and a church Facebook account, you have what you need to get started. And I wish every large church pastor that has a huge technical team, anytime you post a picture of all your technical team, please, please also pray for those of us who are just offering um, what the tools that we have access to. Another model that's being used in the inner city are that in the clusters, the pastors are rotating each week who's doing the preaching and um, the th churches are coming together and using one another's services so that uh, no one church has all of the parts and all of the pieces, but they're, they're actually functioning as a, a, a larger ministry with three different sites. So uh, one of my favorite phrases is who will do this with me? Um, if we're getting started and this is not something we're trained in and have expertise in, there is no harm in reaching out to other people who have been doing it and partnering with them in some capacity. Because as has already been said, many of our churches now are pre-recording services. And uh, so you can get a team of people together throughout the week 
to, to do this to help you as well. I could just jump in for a second. I'm going to interrupt for a quick second. Um, I know a couple of people are, are uh, going through our Q&A and saying that there's some technical difficulties. I would say if sound goes out, first thing to do is check your own settings, but I'm also noticing there could be some high traffic on Zoom tonight. And if there's high traffic on Zoom, that affects everybody's video quality. And so that's completely out of our hands. I wish I had bought stock in Zoom uh, prior to all of this, but I am not that smart in order to find that out. So we have no control over some of the video and audio quality. That's really the Zoom. So be patient. We're, you know, even though we've been doing this for eight weeks, and I know Rodney and I have been doing this since the fall with our training Tuesdays, it's still very new for all of us. Um, I did notice there's a lot of people asking in the chat about um, interaction for uh, services that are not live. Um, and just as a, as a, just really quickly, there's a free service called the church online platform. That is uh, churchonlineplatform.com that will let you run your service as a simulated live event and give you options for chat and engagement and all sorts of stuff. So that's a super great resource to check out if you're looking for uh if you're looking for ways to increase engagement during your online service. And Ben, that's actually an excellent um, way. Um, Tim Ward over at Restoration Church does that each week. He's, he's streaming and he's live in the chat giving the, the conversation. And so even as the worship is going on, he's able to facilitate um, engagement. That's exactly the way we do it at the common table. We have found that, for us, there's a lot of people that really love doing uh, their their worship broadcasts live, and I think that's super cool. We did that for a couple of weeks, and for us, it was it, it was a lot easier for us to engage with folks that were there in worship if we weren't on camera because of the delays and things like that that happen with live streaming, where we could actually, uh, if we pre-recorded, we knew what was coming, and we could be there with the people while church was happening, uh, and it it just worked better that way for us. So yeah. Uh, yeah, just to kind of tag on to that simulated live, um, because typically I'm part of um, Sunday worship in one way or another, um, but the simulated live allows me to do the pastoral care that I usually do before and after services. You know, all of those conversations of, hey, if you just have one second, like right before you go to preach or right before you, whatever, that'll only take a minute. Yeah. Um you can actually have 20 minutes of, you know, five different, six different um, personal chats. And it is hugely helpful. I didn't get any of that when we were um, doing live, but every week when we do simulated live, our doors, our, our coffee hour opens 15 minutes before worship and then stays open after. And more pastoral care happens there or then, you know, follow up then then a lot of times because people are there and wanting to talk and see you and they can see my face on the screen and I can type responses while I'm preaching. Um, you know, and so it's, that's, that's been a huge engagement piece for us. Um, and, and kind of a, a nice blessing to, to be able to do that. So. Now I know because some people have asked about the online platform that's church dot online. Is that correct? Uh, that's churchonlineplatform.com. Churchonlineplatform.com. But I also know, William, you have been experimenting with a new um, streaming broadcast service. Would you like to just lift up the name of that one? It's called StreamYard. And the reason I use it is because I can broadcast to several platforms all at the same time. And so um, usually when I'm broadcasting, I'm on Facebook Live. I'm on um, YouTube and I'm on Twitter all at once. And as I'm talking, like tomorrow, we're going to have a conversation with some pastors and we're going to stream it. And the, the goal is I have three different audiences and I want to engage all of them without stressing them to have to go to one or the other. And so that's worked out well. And the video quality is excellent on all three. And that is streamyard.com. Thank you. 
I don't want people to think we're only preferencing one service <laughs> over another, but that's StreamYard.com. I know I've I've been playing with it and um, it, it's got some interesting um, features. Another question that people have been coming up with is, so there's engagement, but how do I get contact information from people? How do I gather their, their personal data so that I can reach out to them after the service is over? Who wants to jump in on that one? We created a virtual connect card that's part of our live stream page. So if you go to our live stream page, there's a connect card. And we regularly, or at least three times throughout the service, at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end, we invite people to please take a moment to complete that connect card. We have found that by far we get a whole lot more connect cards when we're in our physical space than we do in our online space. So I'm always profoundly grateful when someone, especially a new person, does complete it. But there is space to do that, to let us know name, address, if they're interested in signing up for a weekly email, if they want to be given information about online giving, if they want to share a prayer request or a message with the pastor. And so we have that. And then extend the invitation is also really important. But it's also super critical that if someone fills that out, that they're also responded to on a Sunday afternoon as well. I know at Impact Church down in Atlanta, before you can log on to the chat, they ask you, are you a first-time visitor or not? And so if you click on it that you are a first-time visitor, the um, online pastor sends you a link um, through the private chat saying, welcome, with all the information. And so that's another way of engaging and getting information. Well, now, how do, you know, I'm going to jump around a little bit just because I kind of gauge the amount of questions that come in. Um, jumping back to the pre-recorded, um, Donna, are you doing your services live or pre -recorded? We are doing them live. We have a couple of pre-recorded pieces that are musical or a testimony, which we call an MVP moment at Mount Vernon Place. So those pieces have been pre-recorded, but everything else is live. And is somebody monitoring a chat or some kind of feedback while you're doing it live, or have you gotten to that point yet? So we're still, that's one of the things that we've been learning. When we first started, we had someone logged in as Mount Vernon Place, obviously, and then another person who was watching for visitors. But over the last couple of weeks, we've been trying to remind our congregation that they have a role in greeting as well. So on a Sunday morning, we hope and pray that no one walks in our building without knowing that they've been fully seen and fully welcomed. And so helping our congregation see that we still have to do that in the online platform as well. So when we invite people on Facebook Live to say, please let us know where you're from and how you're joining us today or from where you're joining us today. Uh, I get so nervous if someone says I'm here and I'm joining from Brooklyn in Northeast DC, but then no one says hello to them or no one acknowledges it. But it's trying, we have to train our congregation to do that. And so now we're at the place where we're lining up two to three virtual greeters for every single Sunday who know that it's their role to be scrolling through to make sure that every single person who has let us know that they're here uh, is responded to and in the same way we would if we were in our building. We are so glad that you're here today. Thank you for being with us. What a gift to have you, whatever those comments are. So that brings up a good point. You take, from what I'm hearing, Donna, you take the same amount of time to train these virtual greeters as you would training any other person for ministry if it were in person. We've just learned that we have to do that. Okay. So okay. This wasn't a natural instinct, but that I think sometimes we assume that people know what to do. And when this is new for all of us, we really can't take anything for granted, including those steps of making sure that we want to convey as much of the warmth and hospitality that as someone might experience who's in our building and we have found that that's incredibly hard to do in this virtual reality. So how is it then can we can add the belt and suspenders to make sure that people are lined up to do some of that virtual greeting uh, and expressions of gratitude for someone being with us? Wonderful. Um, 
Now for for Chris and Ben with those pre-recorded services, how do you handle things like um, I know a lot of churches like to do joys and concerns and prayer moments. How do you handle those kinds of um, moments in worship? So we we build them in just as if we were going to do them live. Um, a lot of people I've heard this in other places where people are are scared of having quiet space or dead air uh, during their church service. Uh, but from from the jump, we have done it at the common table where we have um, we have an invitation for people to share their joys and concerns in the chat. And then we have 60 seconds of total silence during the broadcast where people can do that, where people can share what's on their heart. And then uh, generally either myself or Chris will come back and kind of close up that prayer time. Now, obviously we don't know what was shared. So that pre-recorded prayer is is lifting up kind of the the general prayer requests that were lifted but then we capture those prayer requests uh and share them with our prayer team so those go out uh and are prayed for throughout the week with our with our prayer team at the common table and at faith point so don't be afraid to have some quiet time during your church service it's not like a tv show where somebody's going to assume it's broken and turn it off um you you can as long as you're clear about what's happening uh people understand people will get it yeah well, I worshiped with one congregation on Sunday that they collected their prayer request throughout the week. They recorded on a Saturday, and so they were able to offer up a particular pastoral prayer based on the um, joys and concerns they had received throughout the week. Yeah, I've been editing a service for another congregation that's doing something similar, where they they do uh, they they collect their community's prayer requests and. They're still doing a pre-recorded service, but they're they're sharing these requests during their pre-recorded video. Um, I think it's really important, and this is a good place to say it too, that like we've been doing this for a long time and we've found out what works for us, but there is literally no right way to do this. Like the 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 opportunities that are out there for doing church online are limitless. Like we get to explore and experiment and mess up and just try new things to love people and share God's word on the internet. And it is just, it is such a cool place to be right now. How we got here, not so cool. But the fact that we're here and we're doing this is really awesome. And so don't think that just because we say to do something one way, that that's how you have to do it. Because there's so many opportunities and so many things to explore. I would say there's probably a lot of freedom for creativity because we can literally say, we've never done it this way before. So we're building this bridge as we walk across it. Um, so that should, I would hope that would give some freedom that um, you, you can play with it, you can experiment. Now, now, Donna, a couple of questions are coming in. I know you use Zoom as your platform for worship uh, for the live uh, pieces. Do you have people who will call into Zoom? Or is, do you know? We of? do not have people calling into Zoom. Um, but no, so we're feeding through Zoom. So our worship team is on Zoom, but then okay. Zoom is being fed through Vimeo. And then Vimeo is feeding it to Facebook Live and to our live stream. So the only people who are logged into Zoom on a Sunday morning are the people who are participating in worship leadership and not people who are simply worshiping with us. They're watching on Facebook Live or the live stream. I mean that's a then that's a good distinguishing feature, and I know I've I've talked with a number of people that um, they do have people calling in, and you might if someone's calling in and they can't see it live, you might need to over explain some of the things that are going on. Um, but again, if you have quiet time, announce it ahead of time. If somebody's listening on their phone, let them realize that the call didn't drop. That's just having some quiet time. Um, and all of that's okay. You just might need to do a little more verbal explanation if somebody is on the phone. And, you know, we forget often that the phone is still a wonderful way to connect with people. Um, I would say just about everybody has a telephone. And so we heard last week from Eric Allsgard that maybe we need to um, recreate the phone tree and just begin to reach out and have one member call another member or five people and just stay in touch and connect with people or follow up with people using the phone. It's, it's crazy. We're going back to the phone. We've um, had a lot of success with that. Um, my, my wife, um, Katie Bishop, who's serving right now at, at New Hope, 
um, developed a fantastic system that I know a number of congregations are using. Um, but it's, you know, I think that that in the beginning, when we were communicating with people, uh, we were cr communicating to the masses for comfort. But now that some of that malaise has set in and some of that fatigue, they're really, you know, our communication is for connection and conversation is what I found. And so those, those individual conversations, whether regardless of, of the means, the, the, the personal connection, just like we want to have, is, is super important. Uh, and so that, that's one of the big shifts that I've seen um, since, since beginning all, all of this. Um, I, I kind of wanted to, to touch base on some of the questions that are coming in about um, those who are, are seniors or maybe don't have uh, the technology availability for worshiping online like we're kind of talking about. Um, and I know that like Ben said, the possibilities are endless. Uh, we have some, some friends in our, our kind of cluster around us that are, are doing either um, emails that'll have links to different parts of the service or um, that are just sending out kind of written word, things like that. Um, and so if they, can, if they can open email, that's fantastic. Um, we are burning DVDs of our service and sending them you know, with a couple of weeks at a time to some of our um, less technical folks or the folks that don't have, um, that don't have internet. And so that's something that we're trying. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's a little bit of, a little bit of everything, but there are, are some folks that are doing some really cool stuff with um, posting, posting like to a, a WordPress site or to a web page and just stepping through worship that way at your own pace whenever. Um, so there's really creative stuff um, that's, that's going around. Um, so yeah, it, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, it just kind of is look at just like folks have been saying that, you know, I have, I have a webcam and zoom that's use it, man. Like Donna said, you know, we had an iPhone and a, a stack of hymnals. Let's, let's do church. You know, it's, it's that, I mean, it's that ax spirit of like, you know, we're, we're doing what we can and it, people are coming from all over and they actually understand what we're saying. Right. Um, we're coming up on Pentecost. Give it a try. I think also we want to address the issue that some pastors are uh, saying that, you know, people are just, uh, they're burning out on Zoom and all of these online things and they're just waiting till we can worship in person again. Well, first of all, this platform and other platforms are going to be with us moving forward. They're not going away when the restrictions from going into buildings uh, are lifted simply because people have gotten used to this and churches that are innovating. In other words, uh, they're using it for Bible study. They're using it for the administrative meetings. They're using it for their community gatherings, for their mission teams. Um, where people are getting burned out is where primarily churches have tried to take their usual normal worship service and now capture it into some type of online uh, experience. And it's not inviting the people because as we move forward, there are some things we need to just stop doing online because it's no longer a personal conversation solely with the 10 people on the pews. Once you get on social media, it's going out to the world. So there are some things we've been doing for 50 years that have no relevance in terms of evangelism and outreach and those things. So it is, it is a completely different mindset. Pastors have to retrain and rethink how this uh, tool is going to be used because now we have an opportunity to reach people. I was talking that we've never reached before. I was talking to a pastor today before all of this they averaged about 200, 250 in worship. And now they have almost a thousand people that they are reaching in the course of a full week because people are, that are not able to see it on Sunday, 
are then coming back on Monday and looking at it. Their Bible study is growing. Um, everything that they're doing that they're putting on social media media is uh, getting an increase. But we have to think differently. We, we can't just think about how we used to do stuff. Um, some of our churches are not going to come back, if the truth were told, because people are not necessarily comfortable coming out in public, coming to the building. Some of these churches are struggling with just the thought of what it would cost to do the sanitation and all of those types of things. So this is not just a passing fad. This is going to be with us for a while. So we really have an opportunity to really think uh, creatively about all of the different types of ways that we're using this. And for those who are burnt out on Zoom, you know, people are using free conference call. They're using other ways to uh, connect because that's the real issue here. How are we connecting with our people and expanding that connect to a larger audience? Anybody want to speak to that? But I also think it's really important to honor that online worship isn't for everybody. Right. And if you are a parent with two little toddlers and your toddlers are used to, one of them's used to being in the nursery and one of them is used to being in what we call faith for me during the worship hour, sitting down with two little people and keeping them still for 45 minutes to an hour is extraordinarily difficult I've also heard people say, I, I, it just doesn't work for me. And I think that's where the church has to, we as leaders have to always be thinking about, then what are the other touch points that we are establishing where we can continue to make sure that people of all ages are being fed spiritually, are connecting with other people, are feeling the church reach out to them in a way that reminds them that they're not alone right now. So I also think, too, I mean, it's really important for us to become aware that online worship isn't working for everybody. But then what are those other things that we can be offering during the week that will enable someone to still pro be provided with space to pray, to read scripture, to grow in their faith, to be reminded of community, whatever that might be. Yeah. And churches with vigorous children's ministries are finding ways to reach the children on social media because they're used to the screens, they're used to the phones, they're used to the tablets. And uh, so you're seeing some really creative teaching going on uh, geared specifically for the kids. And again, this is where I wanna again offer that invitation. If your church is not able to do that, please reach out and partner with another congregation and uh, share the gospel uh, for a group that you may not necessarily be able to connect with at this particular uh, juncture in the game. And you brought up something interesting, Rodney, that uh, somebody reached out to you and they have an in-person worship attendance of 30, and now they're seeing their Facebook attendance of 1,000 plus. Um, and I know one question came in because we are good United Methodists and we'd like to keep our statistics all nice and order. And how do I begin to, to wrap my brain around my new average attendance in this virtual world? So how do we, you know, maybe Chris and Ben, you've done this longer. You know, how do we look at all of those analytics that YouTube and Facebook uh, provide to really understand how many people are actually watching our content? Uh, so uh, the short answer to that is you don't. Um, like the, you, you, you get the numbers that whether, whether you're on church online platform or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, you get the analytic data that, that they give you. And those numbers are unique hits to your site uh you you'll see things like peak concurrent viewers and things like that um so usually what we do um just as a rough estimate is we'll look at we'll look at the total number of of hits that the church online service gets and assume that there's at least two people in each one of those hits because there's probably more um on some that, and some are, some are just one and some are families and things like that. Um, and that's a, a good rough estimate per service um, of, of how many, how many eyes are on it. But 
you need to look at, if you're using YouTube, and I know the Church Online platform does it too, you can see views over time. Um, and you can see how many people like literally were viewing for less than 30 seconds. So that's someone who clicked on your video and then just left. So they're not, they didn't really attend your service. They just saw a snippet of it. Um, so you can look at things like that, but, um, yeah, the, the analytics are complicated. And so if it's new to you, just be patient with yourself. And, and I would suggest, uh, Google actually has some great videos on how to read analytics and how to understand what those numbers actually mean uh, that you can find on YouTube. So I would suggest uh, looking at those if you're really interested in in learning how to read those analytics well, um, that's a great option. Yeah, I would just I would just add to to that, like, like Ben said there, th that watch time is really important. I mean, the 30 seconds is like the person that if you have anybody that comes in for coffee and then leaves, like that's kind of the equivalent, right? Um, so kind of two pieces. Number one, it, pick something and, and stick with it. Like pick what a win is for you and stick with it. Because um, if you compare apples to apples for eight weeks, it doesn't matter what those apples are. If you're comparing the same thing and you see trending upward or down, you know something's happening, right? Um, and so we've we've kind of come up with our own internal way of counting folks. Um, but if you're counting apples this week and then oranges next week, and it's just like if you were on Sunday morning saying our total worship number is every breathing person there. And then another counter for another week only counts those who look like they're over 22, you know, then it, it doesn't work. Um, some other interesting things that, that have come across and some trends that, that I've been doing some research on is we have seen across the nation some of those numbers dropping but as the longer that we've gone on. Uh, it may be because of weather is breaking. It may be because people are fatigued. Who knows? But it does mean that there are some new and renewed opportunities for engagement because we're looking at numbers. Um, some of the, the watch numbers as far as time on screens uh, some of the platforms will tell you what people are viewing from, and by far the lowest a time that people are viewing is if they have their phone. So if we're trying to encourage and educate our congregations, it's really like, you know, um, Bill mentioned that, that he and his family Chromecast it to the big screen. That is maybe five times more viewing minutes if it's on a big screen in mm -hmm. front of people. And the smaller the screen, the less time. And maybe that's because if it's on the big screen, I can still be on my phone, you know, but, but the reality is, is, yeah, but the reality is, is that we want to make sure that if they're, if they're in the room with us, if, if they brought us into their, their living room, um, then we want to make sure that we can engage. And so the longer we're there with them, the more opportunity we have to do that. I would also add to that if you're only looking at Facebook views, the little number that shows up on your Facebook page and you haven't dug deep into analytics, get ready to be incredibly disappointed because it's my understanding that the Facebook view is even someone who's scrolled over your page. So uh, they see it, but they haven't looked at anything that you're doing. They've just scrolled over it while you've been live streaming. So if that's the only number that you're looking at, dig a little deeper, but also get ready to be a little bit more disappointed um, about how we might really be doing uh, if that's the only number that you're looking at. I've also, I've also looked at a couple of other stages for engagement, particularly those who are using Facebook. Someone watching for a minute or so was wonderful. I also look at, has somebody liked my post? Has somebody, that's kind of one level. The next level is, have they commented on the post. And I think the, the third level is, are they becoming digital evangelists and sharing the post? You know, if somebody is sharing my video, that tells me they're associating what I'm saying to their profile. And so they're invested in, in what, what I'm saying and the content that I'm delivering. So you may want to also look at those in the analytics. And I have to pause for a second and apologize. Uh, Dr. Smothers, 
I did forget to tell people that you are the director of leadership and congregational development for the Baltimore Washington Conference. So my apologies, sir, um, for for neglecting to do that. There's I'm just I'm just grateful to be on this panel as an ordinary <laughs> citizen on Earth and to learn from these great leaders. Titles don't matter. Expertise helps and. Uh, so, and I want to say this because I think it's so vitally important. There are some incredible folks sitting on our pews who can help us. We don't have to be masters of all things uh, related to social media. We just need to reach out and ask folks, hey, is there anybody that's a part of this community that has any experience with any of this stuff? And, uh, and it's a way to start a new ministry to uh, get people excited. And our young people who are digital natives, uh, they can help us with a lot of this stuff as well. So again, the, the real question is, how do we uh, capitalize on the human resources that we have that are around us already that are just waiting for an invitation to participate? Thank you, Rodney. We could probably spend the rest of our time talking about this digital worship, but I want to move on for a second. And um, Donna, you have a unique position on this panel. You are one of the few clergy in our conference who has already left their building previously and had to worship otherwhere at other places as you prepare to, to relaunch ministry in that site. So give us a brief synopsis of what happened when you first started at Mount Vernon Place and what lessons can you share with us that have prepared you for this particular unique moment in history? Thanks, Bill. So I've been at Mount Vernon Place since 2005. And in my third week there, the congregation voted to redevelop property. And by virtue of doing that, we had to vacate our property for a year and a half. While our historic building underwent a complete restoration and renovation from top to bottom. And so we left our building, we moved across the street to an old Carnegie Library, and the only access that we had space to was a single wide trailer on the front lawn. And the extraordinary gift that came at the time, too, we were worshiping 50 people with an average age of 82. So when we left our building, that's what, where our congregation was. All of our leaders were in their 80s and in their 90s. Our chair of staff parish was 97. I still think I might have the record for the oldest staff parish chair. Um, but if, you, if, if it's you, if it's someone older than 97, let me know in your church. But by, we had to leave. And it is the only way that some of our ministries could have ever ended. So I talk about how our whole building was full of junk, but our calendar was also filled with a lot of junk. It was stuff that made a big difference to a few people, but a large part of it is things that we had been doing since the 1960s and the 1970s, and no one had really stopped to ask questions. Is it still making a difference? When is the last time that this ministry made a new disciple of Jesus Christ? Why are we still doing this? And right now, all of our churches have been given an extraordinary opportunity because in large part, the one thing that we're doing right now that's the same that we were doing is worshiping at whatever time we were worshiping. We've already talked about how much worship has changed. Most of us are still worshiping at that hour but almost everything else has changed. And so if you have not started a process of asking really important and critical questions that enable you and your team, your leadership teams to be re-evaluating what you were doing, if we bring everything back, then we have missed a huge opportunity. And so to start asking some of the questions, um, what have we stopped doing in the last eight weeks that absolutely no one has noticed? What are those things? Um, what have we been doing for our own sake that has nothing to do with the sake of Jesus Christ, with the sake of the gospel? Um, what are some of these things? We and uh, I had a privilege of writing a book a few years ago, and we wrote the first chapter is all about pruning. 
And what we recognize is when you're pruning, it's impossible to grow a petunia plant without daily stopping to pick up uh, all of the little um, blossoms that are starting to decay. So every single day you need to be plucking what is decaying and it's only by doing that that you're able to grow a healthy plant. But it's the exact same thing with our congregations. So what was decaying prior to March 15th, prior to March 1st? What was it that was zapping resources instead of making new disciples, instead of bringing new people in? And how is it that we can start right now to reevaluate all of those things? In many cases, there will be a financial reality to 2020. I don't think we've seen the tip of that. I think that there are a whole series of job losses that are still to come um, in our communities and that the financial impact may not hit us until the third or the fourth quarter if it's not hitting us already. And so we might get to the place where the financial reality forces us to make some of these decisions. But right now, and where are congregation efforts being duplicated? What, um, where are these ministries happening in other places in the city with people that are able to do it better than we're able to do it? Then why do we start doing that? Um, what if we only brought back what is at the real heart of who we say we are instead of bringing something back that's really more farther out from who we say we are at the core of our identity as a congregation? And I also think too, there's gonna to be a huge opportunity for buildings to be transformed into kingdom assets. Um, that when we look at the number of churches um, that will be merged uh, or that will not make it um, to the next appointment year, how are we also thinking about that opportunity for what can happen with these properties um, as well as more and more congregations find life outside of their buildings um, or discover that the buildings are just significant resources that aren't possible to be maintained anymore. Well said, well said. You know, uh, we, we always get questions on how do we get people interested in this? Every congregation is different and we do have to value individual communities and their culture. But just this weekend, for instance, I saw where people really got creative. One church, for instance, had their uh, child care center's graduation as a part of their worship service. Another church, at the end of the regular part, they had photos that members had sent in of their mothers. And it was just a wonderful collage of celebrating Mother's Day in a, in a new and different way. Uh, we've gotten some questions about funeral celebrations, and uh, the funeral industry is now finding ways. I've seen several celebrations of life on social media that, that funeral homes are now making available to families So uh, because of all the other things, the restrictions that we have. So one way to get people interested, particularly seniors and older people, people who have not used the technology, is that you have to really find a way to connect them uh, with something that's near and dear to them so that they can see one another in that senior Bible study or their grandchildren or the people that they're missing um, and uh, all of the other things that are taking place it's innovation, it's creativity, uh, it's taking a risk and doing something that we've never done before. And as far as training sites, uh, YouTube, Google, and other places, there are just a lot of places out there that have uh, training opportunities on how to do this. And uh, uh, so uh, there was even a comedian this week who last weekend did a, uh, a sketch on uh, face uh, on one of the social media sites, and I'm sure somebody else on the panel will remember, of, of a typical Zoom meeting and trying to get everybody's attention. It is so funny, but uh, it is real. It is real. It is real. It is real. So, um, you know, how do we protect privacy? That's another question. 
you know, when we get back in the building, um, you know, these are issues that we are going to have to work through individually. And uh, I think that, uh, again, let's reach out to some folks who've been doing it a little bit longer than we have. Now, Chris, and well, I'll st stick with Chris because Ben kind of joined Chris later on. You've never had a building. Um, well, when I was when I was first appointed, uh, I was appointed to a, a large church um, as an associate, and um, and so then was was appointed to Faith Point that that didn't have a building, and um, yeah, so you know when when everything goes back in the box every week um it's it's kind of nice to uh, flexibilities in the dna um but if you're in a situation where you have a building um and you're looking for things uh i was i was thinking about this on my run today and i was thinking about some of the people that i would reach out to or who had the best ideas when i was in kind of a pinch for what to do either in a physical location or or not and that was that was people who are student ministers and children's ministers because they always have a lack of space and have to put their stuff back in a box 90 percent of the time and they know how to communicate uh, not not just technology but they know how intergenerational conversation happens and so if you're if you're struggling or if you're light on volunteers but you have somebody who's working with young people, reach out to them, um, ask them, give them the problem, give, you know, kind of say, how, how would this work? Because I've joked at Faith Point that I am just a, a student ministry pastor who got a church and that's how I pastor my people. And uh, thank God they are a bunch of nerds. Thank God for the Bishop who, who appointed me there because man, oh man, it works. But it's it's because you know that we're we're able to be authentic together. But also, it's that let's let's problem solve a little bit. And if it doesn't work, it nobody knew it after noon, right? Our church, we let the school system take for the rest of the week. We let them borrow it, and we come back and have our church again. And nobody knew that we messed up real bad, because there's always a moment for us where we have to realize standing at the kind of toes curling over the the high dive that no matter how much planning uh has gone into it that there's a moment where we have to jump and if we jump in belly flop that's cool we can learn from that um and so that's really kind of been you know we we talk about we experiment every single week and we get the data and we go back to the drawing board every single week um and that's that's kind of what has driven the faith point community, which has then that DNA has kind of been um, shared then with the common table. And uh, so if something doesn't work, we really appreciate our people who say, man, that was terrible. And usually we know, um, but if we don't, they'll tell us and that's valuable. Um, and, and then we can problem solve and we can make sure it doesn't either it doesn't happen again or there's a reason why it does because we're invested in it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of flexibility. It's a lot of stress, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a mixed bag, but it's, it's fun. You know, I, I enjoy it, but I don't, I don't like things staying the same. Um, so yeah, I can't let, I can't let my wife hear that as we are in the moments of moving right now though, um, because, oh, you know, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's definitely a mentality shift of trying to be flexible. Yeah. But Chris, I also want to highlight on that too. Uh, how are we seizing this opportunity, every single one of us, to make sure that we are doing something that makes us as afraid as jumping off of a high dive right now? And if we are not doing things that make us afraid right now, then I'm not sure we're seizing the moment in the way that th this moment has to be a time of experimenting and doing things that are way outside of our comfort zone. Uh, that enable us to see what works and what doesn't. And if we haven't done something yet that hasn't worked, then I'm not sure we're trying enough right now either. Yeah, yeah now is the perfect time to do things that are uncomfortable because everything's uncomfortable anyway. 
So you just get to you just get to try new things and be experimental. Chris and I had the opportunity to do some coaching with a church, uh, a UMC church in Virginia. And one of the things they were talking about who they could pull in uh, to use as greeters online. And somebody mentioned, well, what about so-and-so from the children's ministry? And they said, oh, no, we can't. That person is crazy. We can't do that. And I was like, no, no, no. Crazy is exactly what you want. Like, that's that's who you want in your church online chat to be engaging with people and loving on people. Because those people who are crazy about kids, they will just they will just love on your folks that show up at church online. And if if we're not doing that, then what are we what are we doing it for? Right. Like, why are we even doing church online if we're not just splashing love all over the people that are there, right? William Cheney. We're going to get you to talk now. (laughs) You are in the business of helping people start new congregations. Mm -hmm. So you live in a world of constant change and chaos and unknowns. So how are you incorporating all of those things into our current environment around this social media context. I was challenged by um, another United Methodist conference right around everywhere to figure out a way to ignite new ministries. And this was before we got into the pandemic and the shutdown. And what I did is I used uh, the New Church Accelerator, which is one of the courses I taught. And also I used High Impact Ministries. And I put those into a paradigm based on the principles within human centered design. And it right now that is, that is taking off all over the place. Um, Because as you put, look at human centered design and high impact leadership with the new church principles, people are birthing new ministries. And we go through a process. It's very simple. After we've taken the leaders through the uh, analysis portion, the first part is the wildness of innovation. And we have a big white board where we just put all the possible things that you could be doing um, as a part. But then we go to our second spot, our second stage, which is alignment. And we ask the questions that Donna was was, articulating a little bit earlier. What is essential for kingdom building in this place? And and one of the things that we're really encouraging people, two things that uh, are really, we're gonna have to realign finances and realign all of our staff. Many people have staff that was uh, previously chosen based on a paradigm that will never return. Does your staff line up with the mission? The second thing that we're telling them is your building is already too large for what's coming. And so do you need to come up with a social enterprise to help um, maintain the funds of that overhead? Is there a need within your community that you can uniquely serve that generates income for the community based on who you are. And under alignment, we do a lot of cutting out of of the old ministries because if it doesn't line up, we don't even talk about, well, how do we possibly resurrect it? We're looking for the bare essentials to do ministry. The, The next portion is around the discipline. What are the spiritual disciplines necessary individually and corporate for the church to continue on this path of rebuilding and part of that is what we call the five D's. We, we, you need to be able to make ministry happen really quickly within a system that is not dependent on the pastor. So we say, first, you got to discern, then you have to design, then you have to develop, deploy ministries, and then debrief. And that system has to keep rolling over and over, not just with the pastor, but needs to go out into the leadership so that ministries get started and sometimes even stopped really quickly based on are they achieving the mission that you were, um, you articulated in the innovation portion. William, can you go through those D's again? Yes. Discern, there has to be a time of prayer uh, before you get started in this. Is this what God has called us to do? Discernment. The next thing is designing it. How do you design a ministry with the resources that you have that are available? Then you develop the ministry. Who are the people? When it, who are the people, the resources that are necessary to make this happen? And then deploy it, get it out. And we say that if you've, de- if you've designed a ministry that takes you over 30 days to deploy, it's not the right ministry for this time. And then we say debrief. Did it achieve the mission that we say we wanted to, to achieve? If not, goes back into design to redesign. 
If it did, how can you do it better? So those five Ds come under the discipline, what is next for the church? Then we want to know what are the predictable patterns in the life of the church? What are the things you're going to do that the community, whether they're online or not, can, can depend upon? One of the things that we have found is that as we're looking at dependable patterns, the evangelism of the church changes when you accept the fact that your reach is now the total social network of everybody who's a regular attender. That's a game changer if you engage your congregation to that core to say, we're asking you to reach out to be a part of connecting with new people. So when new people come in and it's a warm contact, that is somebody that somebody already knows, it's much easier to nurture that person in discipleship and in the life of the church than somebody who comes in off the internet who had no connection. Then we've already been talking a lot about engagement. Engagement is the key to keeping congregations um, growing. Um, when Gallup did the research around engagement, churches that had shifted from 80-20 to 70-30 experienced four quick things. One, there was increased giving, increased discipleship, increased service, and increased um, activity within the life of the church as far as um, being a part of, of ministry. So when you shift from 70, uh, from 80-20 to 70-30, the income usually doesn't just incrementally grow, but it, it actually multiplies. And so then finally, we want to ask the question at the end of the process, what is the value, the spiritual value we bring to this community of faith, whether it's online or whether it's in person? Because if we're not bringing value to their lives, if we're not helping them to experience Jesus Christ in a whole new way, the love of God in their lives in a way that they haven't experienced before, are we really maintaining um, our call as uh, ministers of the gospel? So when we take churches through that process, my whole goal is to make sure I leave and that they're able to maintain it on their, on their own. And that's, that's a shift that's even happening within um, how the coaches are working. You know, the joy of a coach is when some, a pastor says, I would love to hire you for 24 months. That is the, I mean, that's a great joy for many coaches. But the reality is the number of people who need to be served, they need to be equipped to actually be able to maintain and grow within the life of the church. And so I'm now saying you have 12 months, I'll give you the tools, I will train the people, and then I want you to take it on yourself. Now I'll come back for maintenance, but I really, my, my whole goal now is, if we're gonna actually seize this moment, there has to be engagement from the coaches that's more about the church being empowered than having longevity of a contract. Thank you, we, we appreciate that. And people are already asking, uh, if it's possible for us to make some arrangements for you to have some further conversation about these things, and um, we will certainly uh, take that under consideration. But I want to ask a question. Let's say I'm a pastor. I've been in ministry 10, 15 years, and I'm not a techie at all. I mean, I can, you know, I can answer my phone and send an emoji every now and then. And now all of a sudden you want me to, to operate cameras and microphones and, and all that type of stuff. Um, I didn't sign up for that. How am I going to survive? None of us, sure. None of us signed up for this. I don't know of a single person who said yes, God, and went to seminary in order to preach online or in order to do pastoral care through an iPhone and to not be able to be present with people. Mm -hmm. I also think that if we hold back, we are missing an extraordinary opportunity for God to use what's available to us. And again, you do not have to have a camera if you have a smartphone. If you have a smartphone, you already have a camera. If you have a music stand, you don't need a tripod, even though I now have a tripod, uh, but you don't need that. But I think we can come up with a million excuses or, for, or name a hundred barriers that are in place before us right now for how we can't do ministry. And if, but if there are a hundred barriers, there are 150 opportunities for how we can do ministry right now. 
Well said. And I think that's what we have to focus on. I, I also think William too, I want to pick up too, mm -hmm. it could be very easy right now to create a consumer mentality. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is putting together um, something that people can just stop in and consume for 45 minutes or for an hour on a Sunday. If we are only focused right now on how many people we get to see viewing our Facebook live stream or how many people are viewing things when we dig into analytics, and not paying attention to the number of people who are taking that next faithful step, whether it's making their first gift, a financial gift, whether it's offering a prayer request, whether it's signing up to be part of a small group, that if we're only focused on worship attendance right now and putting that above engagement, then I also think that we're, what we're gonna do is just perpetuate a consumer mentality that enables me to consume 30 minutes of this service and 30 minutes of that service, just as I'm going to consume Netflix when this um, webinar ends tonight. And I'm totally agreeing with you. We can find ways to do ministry. None of us signed up for, but God called us to this. And if there's nothing else that, that I leave with is that that's important and it is urgent. Um, my next door neighbor is a retired Presbyterian pastor. And for the last three weeks, he's had hot dogs on Tuesdays. And what he did was he went from door to door and just left a note. I'll be having prayer and hot dogs and I'm serving. And so people are sharing their prayers right next door. We're praying for anybody who comes. Social distancing is still in place. But what he said is there are people on this block who've never heard of Jesus Christ, and they have a negative view of the church. And although I'm retired, I still have a responsibility. He, did, he didn't let the fact he didn't have a church stop him from doing ministry. And so I would just like to echo what Don said. We can put barriers up. That's not what we were called to do. We were called to overcome those barriers for the kingdom. Thank you. You know what? I'm, I want Bill to come with an announcement, but I want all of our presenters to be thinking about what your final thought is. What is the one thing, the one thing that you want people to hear from you tonight? But before we do that, we realize that some of you are beginners at this process and you're wondering about equipment. And, and Bill has already referenced the prior uh, teaching Tuesday that we had, which was on a Monday. And we talk a lot more about the actual equipment uh, on that uh, particular episode, he's going to reference that. But we, the uh, Office of Congregational Development Leadership and the Office of uh, New Faith Expressions, New Congregational Development and Growth, have a wonderful opportunity for you in the form of some grants. William, where are you? I'm in my basement. Um... All right. <laughs> Let's Let's share with folk how we're going to help them get started and to continue, not just getting started, but to continue in this process. And then we're going to ask each presenter to come back with a closing thought. So we launched on Monday, which seems like forever ago, but that was just yesterday. We, off, we launched uh, through the eConnection, a micro-grant opportunity for grants for online worship and technology. And so if you did not receive that um, information in the e-connection, it should be going active on the conference website, but I'll follow up with that tomorrow. And there's an online form. We just ask you to fill out the form. There's some requests for some narrative conversation about how you are going to leverage your online presence and what technology uh, you may need. And we're offering grants for up to $1,000 to help churches begin to either uh, get into some equipment for the first time so that they're not using their pastor's iPhone any longer or to help churches upgrade. And we're just trying to help out as many of the churches in our annual conference as possible during this time. And it's anyone, any local church in the annual conference is eligible. Wait a minute, small churches are eligible? Medium-sized churches are eligible? Churches with buildings. All churches are eligible, Rodney. All? All. Okay, but suppose they don't even know anything about technology. They can call you. 
<laughs> and you'll refer them to Chris and Ben. <laughs> there you go. See? There we go. All righty, Ben. What's the one thing you want us to leave here tonight with? The one thing I would leave you with is to be gracious with yourself. Everybody is learning right now, and we all have this heart and this desire to reach people for Jesus and to show people just how much Jesus loves them. And right now, that can be really challenging. So as you're struggling to figure out what that means for you, remember to be gracious with yourself because your, uh, your mission is good and your mission is great. And I'm so excited that you are trying to do it. I also want to say I am serious. My email address is commentableonline at gmail.com. If you email me there, I will do my absolute best to get back to you with an answer to whatever question you have. My passion is to help churches do church online well. So please use me as a resource. If I'm, you know, I probably get a lot of email. So if I don't get back to you right away, be patient, but I will do my absolute best to do as much as I can to make sure that you are uh, feeling confident and ready to do church online. Say that address again a little slower. Common table online at gmail.com. And someone really likes your hoodie. Yeah, that's from Chris Bishop. Okay, Donna, <laughs> guess what? Donna? Get my turn? Yes, guess what? What? I just purchased my tripod today. All right, good. They're less than 20 <laughs> bucks. Who knew? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I would say that this is really hard, that so much of what we're doing right now is hard and challenging, and the learning curve for many of us is extraordinarily steep, but that we cannot allow the difficulty to prevent us from trying, trying it and to going all in or to diving off the, the deep or the high end, the high dive, whatever it might be. I also think like the way that the spirit is working right now, God is so active through what it is that we are willing to offer to be used. And please don't discount that. And then my third thing is please, 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 please reevaluate everything that your church is doing and do not take everything back with you when you go to the building that was there at the beginning of March. You will miss a significant opportunity to make space for all the new things that God wants to do if we don't leave some of that behind. Okay, thank you. Who, who's left? Chris Bishop. Yeah, um, I, I do think that um, kind of to reiterate what has been said, um, we may have we may have a knee-jerk reaction to be like Moses at the burning bush with a thousand reasons to say no to God. And God reminds us that there is an Aaron right beside us. Um, I, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say again uh, about what Ben said, is that if there's a way that, that I or he can be an Aaron for you, uh, we have had the, the blessing of doing this for a little while. Uh, and we are nerds and love it. And so if you want some, some help with that, please reach out um, because we would love to, to help with that. But, but really it's, um, you know, I am an introvert and whether it be in person or online, um, you know, that kind of interaction is exhausting to me. I'm going to have to go take a nap before I go to bed tonight because of this. Um, but, but at the same time, that's not keeping me from jumping in um, and trying to figure out, you know, how we can do um, church in a new way, because I believe that there are ways to do church that are meaningful and relevant that have never been explored. And this is just going to supercharge that. So yeah, let's, let's make this journey together uh, instead of making excuses with one another. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cheney. One thing I would like everybody to remember, I know there's a lot of energy being put into taking care of our congregations and the, those who've been serving with us for a long time, but I'm going to encourage people to also be aware of those who've been hurt by church, who are far from God, um, who we also now have a new opportunity to reach. 
um, they're also important to God. And this is a new opportunity for us to reach them where they may have never come into the church building, but they're willing to visit and share with you online. Brother Brown. You caught me while I was trying to answer a question. I'll get back to that question in a second. Um, what I would like people to leave with are two things, and I'm going to make an announcement about next week. But what I'd like people to leave with is you've had the opportunity to uh, unwillingly, unbeknownst to you, launch a new faith expression. And I know a lot of what we've been doing has been how do we keep our current congregation together during this time, and that's been wonderful. But I want you to begin to think how you can reach those, as William said, who are far from God. How can we take the church that Jesus loves and bring it closer to the people Jesus loves? And you're doing that. So don't give up on that when we return to in-person worship. Um, using this platform of introducing people to Jesus through online means is wonderful. So please don't give that up when we return to in-person worship. So I'd like people to remember that. Okay. Well, we are certainly grateful to all of you. Bill, you're going to talk to us a little bit about what's ahead. Yeah, so I know all of us are getting really over-zoomed. I know we're getting webinared out. I know we're getting screen-timed out. Um, but Rodney and I launched this Training Tuesday concept back in the fall of 2019, which seems like eons ago, in order to equip local churches uh, to reach more people and connect more people to Jesus and develop more principled Christian leaders. And we're happy that we started it back then and leveraging it for right now as a way to offer people a free resource to equip them better in order to serve, um, serve God. And so what we've done beginning next week is we have taken content that was created for our Spring Connect Leadership Summit. I know two of our uh, regions were able to um, have their Connect Leadership Summit. Two of our regions were not able to have their Connect Leadership Summits. So we are repackaging the presenters from the Connect Leadership Summits. And starting next week, um, we're continuing this reopening, renewing, and restarting theme. And our presenter is James Tate. And the title of next week's webinar is Discovering a Pathway to Peace when life feels off track. So I want to encourage um, registration uh, should go live tomorrow, um, but uh, I think that's a timely topic, uh, discovering a pathway to peace when life feels off track. And I don't know about everybody else, but it feels really off track right now. So join us next Tuesday at seven o'clock. All righty. Well, I tell you, we still have, uh, as always, questions that we did not have an opportunity uh, to get to, but we are grateful for your support. And we also want to remind you that these sessions are recorded for your viewing later, and uh, you can have a watch party. You can actually invite other members of your congregation to sit down and view with you virtually. Uh, at a later day and time, and it's always helpful. These have been gifts that keep on giving. I, again, I want to refer you back to the uh, previous recording uh, with Chris and Ben and, and uh, the just the phenomenal wisdom they shared about equipment use and services use and how they've started. And Donna, you've reminded us tonight uh, about the the people part of this because it's it's not just about a system and equipment uh, it is really about people and William you have reminded us that we don't have to do this alone that uh, there are people who are trained and equipped and willing to come alongside of us to uh, assist us uh, um, in many many ways. Um, and I want to just say this last thing, and this is especially in preparation for next week. We are very conscious of the fact that this technology, social media and all that is literally pushing some people to the edge. Folks, 
Don't let it overtake you. Please reach out. Please let someone know that you need some help. Please take some time off. And uh, in fact, next week, I'm going to begin a 30-day time of renewal just to kind of, whew, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Whew, because of all the things that we have been doing. And I want you to take some time off too. So you've got to get some other folks in there to help you uh, so that the show will go on. But we do need to get some rest, some renewal, and uh, take care of ourselves. All right, Dr. Brown. Well, I want to thank you, Rodney. I think it is public because it's been on the conference website. You're renewing because we know you, in addition to your duties with us in leadership and congregational development, you're going to be serving a local church come July 1. And so you will be um, taking all that you've been learning in these webinars and you get to apply it. So we'll have you back so you can give us a webinar on, on how you apply everything you've been learning. So when you don't see Rodney over the next couple of weeks, nothing's wrong. We are, we are grateful that he is taking some time to renew and rest up and um, continuing to lead us within this annual conference. So I'm grateful for uh, his mentorship and his wisdom um, that he provides myself and so many others. So thank you, Rodney. And with that, I'm going to invite you to pray us out, sir. All right. Loving God, we are thankful indeed for the many men and women who have joined us through the medium of technology tonight. We know that they are servant leaders and that they are listening and learning and launching and helping their congregations enter into new phases and stages of engagement as we seek to lead people into vital relationships with Jesus Christ. We can't do it by ourselves. We have to do it in community and we have to do it with mentors and coaches and consultants and colleagues and friends and members and other people who will come alongside of us and make this happen. We are grateful for the resources that you entrust to us, both human and otherwise. We are grateful for a leadership team that is able to enact the vision of our Episcopal leader to make certain that every single church is resourced in a meaningful way. We are grateful for the families who sacrifice so that we might include these additional times to resource those whom you have entrusted to us. Now, as we go forth, continue to bless us, speak wisdom to us, and grant us your peace. These and all things we pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Thank you, Rodney. And I am so grateful for all the panelists, Chris and Ben and Donna and William, for taking time out of your schedule or your rest to um, be able to equip people in our churches. I'm very grateful. Thank you for the wonderful information you provided us tonight. Amen. Uh, God bless everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, connect with some of you next week. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night.